So here's this young guy that comes back, and for some reason the sheriff had not gotten that message, came by and heard some loud talking in the alley and, and said, be quiet. And Clyde just continued to, continued to talk in a normal voice. And so the sheriff came up and took his billy club and tried to hit him over the head. Clyde just restrained him. The sheriff stood back, pulled his gun, and shot him. He was taken across the street, the main street in New Hebron, around the back of a pharmacy. And the per word went out, the Perkins came down, Clyde was put on his brother's lap. John was about 16 then. And they traveled as fast as they could to Jackson, but they couldn't save Clyde, he died. <clears throat> and so that started a pilgrimage for the whole Perkins family, because in Mississippi you could either stay and die or go to prison or be broken, or you could leave and go to Chicago or Detroit or New York or Los Angeles. So fast forward, and you heard John's testimony this morning. In 1960, God leads him back to Mississippi. And in 1970, he was beaten almost to death for registering people to vote by Mississippi Highway Patrolmen and Sheriff's deputies. 1971, he's just recuperating, and he's the first black man to speak at the Glendale Presbyterian Church, which is the church that I came to Christ at. I got galvation before I got salvation. That means I follow my girlfriend to church. <laughs> so I showed up, and I was going to USC at the time, and John spoke. Now, I had grown up, you know, when I was in sixth grade, John F. Kennedy was shot. When I was in high school, Martin Luther King was shot. I grew up with Vietnam. Watts burned the first time when I was in junior high school. I needed Jesus to be the answer to my life, but not just the answer to my personal uh, morality issues or meaning or purpose in life or sex or drugs or whatever, but I needed Jesus to be the answer to poverty and injustice and all the big issues in my world. And so when I heard John Perkins speak, as he was recovering, it, it galvanized in my mind this, this whole sense that the gospel might just have the chance to be the answer to everything in the world. And so he challenged a group of us to go down to Mississippi. I went down in 72 in the summer, came back, got married at 19 years of age. We went down for what we thought was going to be a second summer together, Terry and I, and we, that second summer ended up stretching into 11 years. Now, flash forward a little bit, we did some, we established a health center in, in Mendenhall, and just so that you know, just so that you demythologize this, we didn't know anything about what we were doing. The health center was formed in a low-lying area that eventually flooded. The x-ray machine was, was uh, wiped out the two days before it was supposed to be dedicated. But the health center ended up relocating and became the first black enterprise right across from the county courthouse in Simpson County. So health care, politics, breaking the bonds of racism, all that immediately was tied in together. Now, when we were back down in the quarters, uh, just, just to give you a snapshot, the first summer we were there, we hired f five black girls. These were kids in high school or junior high. Now, would you go to a clinic where there was a young black girl with the nurse that was taking your history or that was working with the lab tech in the lab or, I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know anything about problem-oriented medical records. We didn't know anything about continuity of care. We just knew that there was this huge need for health care. And Vera May had done a, a survey and that's why the health center was started. But these, now let me just tell you though, that anything worth, doing well, uh, anything worth doing is worth doing poorly, right? <laughs> Out of those five girls, Shirlene became a licensed medical technologist. Sarah became a registered nurse. Um, Mary Hardy became a licensed clinical social worker. Physical therapist. Physical therapist. Yeah. And uh, Lynn Phillips became a physician. She was one of the first black woman graduates of the University of Mississippi Medical School. And Joni Perkins, Joni Perkins, John's daughter, became an attorney. So you had, had to do some, had to have malpractice in there somewhere, right? 
You always lose one. We started that. It was, <laughs> <laughs> we started that 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 health center. Then uh, we all moved to Jackson, started to work up there. Well, in, just to just to wind up the story back where it began in 1946. In 1978, two people came to John from New Hebron. The white man who owned the pharmacy, remember the pharmacy? Myron Lee. And a black man by the name of Isaac Newsom, who was a deacon at Oak Ridge Missionary Baptist Church. Both of them came to Reverend Perkins together. They said, we need a doctor. Our town is languishing because we don't have a doctor. So he gave that assignment to the white boy from Southern California. I eventually realized, Terry and I eventually realized that we were gonna to have to move from Jackson. Now we had, we had planted one of the first multi-ethnic congregations in Mississippi. And it had finally grown to about 300. We were just, you know, so I mean, this is one of those situations where I said, honey, I think we're supposed to move down there. She said, I think the Lord's telling us to move to New Hebron. She said, well, I wish he'd tell me. <laughs> so it was about a year when we, until we discerned that. But we went down, started the health center. And that's how CCHF was born, because we couldn't get doctors. And we, we, wrote to, we wrote to everybody we could think of, and then we had people refer, and this is before email. And what we began to hear again and again were medical students saying, you know what, this, this is what I want to do. I, I'm not ready yet, but this is what I want to do. And by the way, would you stay in touch with me? Because what I find happening in my life is that I am being enculturated out of a concern for the poor. And the way that works is, is that I'm being thrust into an inner city learning situation in an emergency room in a teaching hospital, and that's going to be my, that, that's going to, that's going to, I'm going to pay my dues, and then I'm going to go be a dermatologist in the suburbs. That's the, that's the cultural push and the trend. Would you stay in touch? Could we stay in touch? And it ended up that Lance Loberg and I, a guy, he was a medical student who came down to help us uh, do the recruitment. That mailing list ended up becoming CCHF. We started the health center. We re remodeled. A, we got a couple of doctors, Wayne Clausen and Walter Neff and Earl Martin and some a nurse practitioner, Irene Shomas, uh, a dentist, Reed Stemple. They came down got the National Health Service Corps involved, got the Rural Health Initiative money from the federal government. But, so we remodeled the old health center. We shut down the black waiting room and the white waiting room, and we made one waiting room. I still have the sign that says white from the door of the white waiting room. We, we, because the, the, the area had 55% black and 45% white, we knew it had to have black, five, six black and five white on the board with a black chairman. That's a whole story in itself. Mm. When we got a new health center built, we shut down the street, put up a tent, and there in front of the, uh, under that tent was, were black and white folks sitting together, celebrating the establishment of their new health center with the doctors and the nurses, and the dentists. <clears throat> and I'm just a guy in his 20s with a clipboard, right? I'm just running around making sure that the, that the sound system works. We're just putting that together. John Perkins is standing behind the lectern next to Governor William Winter, who's a white man. One of the things that I had to get over in the South was my racism against white folks because Southern Californians are arrogant enough to think they aren't racist. And what I discovered, one of the gifts that God gave me was to find that some of the most noble human beings on the planet are white Southerners that took a stand for reconciliation because it cost them something. Mm. Yeah. So here's William Winter and John Perkins standing there, and I look between them, and what I see from between them is the pharmacy that Clyde was drug around the back of and I said, there is a God, and he is a God of reconciliation. Dr. Perkins, um, behind you, everybody else can see it, but you, I'm going to read it to you. This is from, you wrote this in 1976. 
One of the greatest tragedies of the civil rights movement is that evangelicals surrendered their leadership in the movement by default to those with either a bankrupt theology or no theology at all, simply because the vast majority of Bible-believing Christians ignored a great and crucial opportunity in history for genuine ethical action. The evangelical church, whose basic theology is the same as mine, has not gone on to preach the whole gospel. Sounds about true now, too. Um, I want to ask you a question you've been asked a million times. Um, let me back up a second. Just in the last week when I was talking about you, I reread your biography to one of these super bright medical students that's visiting with us in Memphis. She said, you know, we were talking about this, and, and when you go back to Mississippi and the setting is that there is a organized and institutional suppression of African American people, that there's the inability to vote to control destiny, the economic opportunities are nil, the system is fixed to benefit others. Um, when Christian people come into that setting, part of the gospel means registering people to vote. Part of the gospel means co -op, economic co-ops and, and peacefully and truthfully speaking against injustice. And she said what many evangelicals have said, isn't the main thing telling people about Jesus? Isn't the main thing salvation and heaven? And so for a new generation of young, many of them evangelicals, help us hear from you that, that this shouldn't be a tension between the two, that, that the whole gospel is all of those things. Okay. Let me, let me give a little background here. Uh, uh, when I was converted in Pasadena, in California, I was discipled. And I was discipled by an, an old elder theologian. He was a child evangelism teacher. He taught teachers, people in the community, how to teach children. Well, he discipled me for three <clears throat> years. I went back to Mississippi, and I ended up in 15 elementary schools, high school, and it was all together, and they were building these schools at this point to avoid integration, and they was... The, the Supreme Court order was that separate but equal wouldn't work, but they was trying to equalize the schools at least. And so I ended up, and for the first time, they come out of one room and two room uh, schoolhouses, now into schools with 2,000, 1,000 people. And I would go there at the end. They had plenty of time. And so I would set up, I set up with 15 uh, of those schools and uh, two junior colleges, and I had a, like a, about a 100-mile a circle that I went in each month. I thought I'd be doing that forever <clears throat> because they loved it. I set the date and all of that. And then, of course, I moved into the, we didn't have a good place to live, and so we found a place to live in Mendenhall, and we ended up there. We started a Bible study with the kids who was coming to Christ in the school. They wanted more than that since I moved to the town. And we started. And so a movement is going here. A big movement is uh, going. And, uh, and then uh, I became a friend to a Baptist, first Baptist pastor. Now, you know in the South, you can't get any bigger than a first Baptist pastor. <laughs> The judge, the lawyers, the sheriff, everybody go to the First Baptist Church. So that's where the power was at. I became a friend to him. Um, and that's the hardest thing. The hardest thing that we black and white had to overcome, uh, black folks had to overcome their inferiority being enslaved so long and with the white man being the master. Black, white folks have to overcome their superiority. And, and it's difficult. 